book of Acts. And this morning, we're in Acts chapter 2, verses 22 through 41. A bit of a longer text, but it is, context-wise, it makes the most sense to me to just finish Peter's sermon here, as opposed to chopping it up some more. So we looked at uh, part one a few weeks ago, going back several weeks now, because we had Christmas in between and things, so it, it's been a little bit, but we're, we're going to look at verses 22 to 41. So Acts chapter 2 records the first Christian sermon ever preached. This sermon was preached by the Apostle Peter to the Jews in Jerusalem during Pentecost. The Holy Spirit came upon the 120 believers there in the upper room as Jesus had promised uh, would happen. And they began to speak in other tongues, which were other known languages, not um, gibberish or just rolling their, their tongue in a strange way. It was a, it was a known language to them, and so people from all over the world, these Jews that came, now heard, um, the, the, as it says, the, the things that God had done, these great things uh, in their own language. And so they were astonished and confused. And they thought they were drunk, um, and Peter... Um, begins to preach to these people and refutes their accusations of drunkenness. And so he, he preaches a sermon to them in the, in the open air, thousands of people. And so we're looking at this sermon in two parts. Uh, as I said several weeks ago, we look at the first part where Peter talked about how the Holy Spirit was uh, prophesied in the Old Testament and, and has now come upon them. And the Holy Spirit was the one who enabled them to speak in other languages. And now is the time where everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord, it says, uh, will be saved. So the first half of Peter's sermon is about the Holy Spirit. Now the second half is about Jesus. And we're going to see how those who heard this sermon, how they responded to it. So let's read Acts 2, 22 to 41. This is Peter speaking. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence that the patriarch David, about the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us today. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And Peter and the rest of the and, and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promises for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them. 
saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. One of the first things you must notice about this sermon right off the bat is the boldness of Peter to say the things that he said. This is the same Peter who just weeks prior denied knowing Jesus to a crowd of people probably a lot smaller than this. This is the same Peter who began to sink on uh, the water because his faith was weak. This was the same Peter who Jesus rebuked by saying, get behind me, Satan. So something has happened to Peter, um, and that something was the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit had come upon Peter and the rest of the 120 there, and the Holy Spirit gave him great boldness to preach Christ to the very people that killed him. And he pulled no punches. And today, we need more preachers like Peter, right? Men who will boldly declare the truths of the gospel regardless of the risk. I think the reason why the evangelical church in America is so powerless today is because we don't preach like this anymore. We'd rather not offend people in the name of love and tolerance than to boldly proclaim the exclusivity of Christ and the severity of man's sin against him. Peter preached a message that could have very easily got him killed. This crowd was part of the crowd that had Jesus arrested or, or, or tried and crucified. They killed Christ. They would have Peter killed, no, no problem. Uh, but because Peter was so filled with the Holy Spirit, he didn't care if it cost him his life. He proclaimed the truth about Christ, no matter what the potential cost may have been. Secondly, notice that the main portion of Peter's sermon is about Jesus His main premise is that Jesus was and is the promised Messiah. He tells them that uh, he proved it to them through his mighty works and signs and wonders that he did to them. So it was so glaringly obvious that Jesus was no ordinary man. He healed the sick. He caused the lame to walk. He gave sight to the blind, performed all kinds of miracles. And on top of that, he taught things that left people, his audience, amazed at, at what he taught because he, it says that he taught them as one that had authority and not like the scribes. So even his teaching alone was affirmation of his divinity, which is something that's often overlooked, I think. He was the son of God in the flesh and he proved it to them. And what did they do? It says in verse 23, this Jesus, who was proven to you through all, the, all these signs and wonders, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. So the lawless men would be a reference to the Romans, but he's addressing the Jews there. They said, you crucified and killed him by the hands of of the Romans. So Peter answers a question they were probably thinking in their minds. If Jesus was the Messiah, why did he die then? Certainly he could have prevented his own death if he was truly God. So Peter tells them that this is all a part of God's plan. Jesus was not just some unfortunate victim. He laid down his life willingly. He says he was delivered up or uh, given over to be, to be killed according to God's definite plan and God's foreknowledge. God had planned and decreed this very event to happen before the world began. And he didn't just know it was going to happen. He didn't just allow it to happen. God planned it this way. He determined it to happen. He caused it to happen. So then you might ask, how could these people be held accountable then for something that God caused to happen? How could Peter tell them, you crucified him by the hands of lawless men when it was God who delivered him up to be crucified? Wicked people, which are all people in their in their natural state do wicked things right you and i left to our own devices would also crucify the lord of glory if we could and if god did not restrain us from doing so right if you're if you're not a believer you don't have the holy spirit and god hasn't given you a conscience or your conscience is harder you would do the same thing we're not any better than than these men were 
God used wicked people to accomplish his plan of redemption. And every evil deed that a person does, whether God uses their deeds, their evil deeds for his own purpose or not, has to also give an account for their sin. They are responsible for their sins against God, and having Jesus crucified is certainly no exception. And we see this many times in the Old Testament, where foreign pagan people like the Babylonians, the Assyrians, the Egyptians, were used by God to punish Israel for their sins. They were an instrument in his hand. Yet at the same time, those pagan people were held responsible for what they did to Israel because of their evil deeds. Just because an evil act by wicked men was the means <clears throat> that God used to accomplish uh, his purpose does not nullify his justice against uh, the evil person, right? So Peter is essentially righteously judging this crowd for their role in the crucifixion of Christ, while at the same time proclaiming that it was all part of God's definite plan. It wasn't plan B. Like, God wasn't like, oh no, the, the, the people sinned, the whole thing went awry, what are we going to do? Okay, Jesus, go. No, this was predetermined before the world began, before creation took place. You see how dangerous a situation this, this was. That Peter just told thousands of people, you're guilty of murdering the Messiah. They could have ended him instantly, all of them. There's thousands of them against Peter. They could have just picked him up and just stoned him and that's it. But Peter trusted God and knew the Holy Spirit wanted him to preach this message. And then Peter moves on to what happened to Christ after he died, which makes all the difference. Jesus didn't just stay dead, right? Uh, verse 24, God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. The fact that God raised Jesus from the dead also should answer the questions of any skeptic who asks, if Jesus was God, why did he die? Because Jesus rose from the dead, it proved that he really was God. It proved that his sacrifice was acceptable to the Father. And Peter preaches the resurrection of Christ not only based on his experience of seeing Jesus alive, but also through the lens of fulfilled prophecy once again, just like he did with, when he was talking about the Holy Spirit. So he goes on there to quote Psalm chapter 16, and then later Psalm 110, with Psalm 16, David wrote, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades or the, the grave uh, or let your Holy One see corruption. So the average Jew at that time would have thought that David was just talking about himself. But Peter says he's talking about Christ, that Christ, the Messiah, would not be left in the grave in Hades or Sheol, and that he would once again come into the joyful presence of the Father. So this was a prophecy of, a resur of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. So if you're looking for Old Testament prophecies about the resurrection, Psalm 16 is one of them. Look at verse, jump down to verse 29 to 31. He says, Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and in his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. In other words, he's telling these people, David's dead. His tomb is still here. So David's not talking about himself. So this is a prophecy about the resurrection of Christ from the dead. So Peter is appealing not only to his own personal dealings with Jesus after the resurrection. He's not giving them a list of reasons why it's reasonable to believe Jesus rose from the dead. He's not trying to, to prove it through uh, logic or anything like that. He's appealing to the word of God as his final authority and says that Jesus fulfilled this Davidic prophecy in Psalms. God's word says that it happened, therefore it's true. Right? The, the starting point for Peter's argumentation his presupposition to everything is the word of God is true. Verse 32 says, This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. 
Now, not only does God's word prophesy um, that the Messiah is going to be raised from the dead, he says that we, we actually witness this. We're all witnesses of, of Christ's resurrection. In Jewish law, biblical Old, Old Testament law, if you needed to prove something to be true, or if you had an accusation against someone, you needed to have two or three witnesses, two or three lines of evidence. You couldn't just um, accuse someone of a crime by yourself, right? You had, with no proof and expect there to be justice, you had to have two or three witnesses. Peter had at least 12, probably a lot more, who saw Christ after he was raised from the dead, which also explains Peter's boldness. Uh, Peter and the apostles and the rest of the 120, for that matter, would not be so foolish as to risk their lives for something they know to be a lie. That they're just making this all up. As some have said, that Christianity was made to just control people, right? If the apostles knew this was just bogus, they're not going to stick their necks out like this and possibly get killed for it, as they all ended up being killed for later on. Why would Peter preach to the crowd of Jews who had just killed Jesus if he didn't believe with all his heart in the truth of the resurrected Christ? Makes no sense. He goes on further to explain how another psalm could not be referring to, to David, but to the, the risen Christ. This time it's Psalm 110, verse 1. If you look at verse 33, to 35, he says, Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. That's Psalm 110.1. Did David ascend to the heavens and sit at the right hand of the Father? No. Are all of David's enemies going to be made his footstool? No. God promised that all the enemies of Christ will be conquered by him. And, and 1 Corinthians 15 tells us the last enemy to be destroyed is death itself. Peter is declaring the lordship of Christ. And the proof that Jesus is Lord is found in the fact that he was raised from the dead, just like the scriptures declared centuries prior. Now verse 36 is the end of of the actual sermon. He says, here's the, the final call, you could say the application. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. The gospel is a message that is to be proclaimed with certainty. It says, let all the house of Israel know for certain, for certain that Jesus is Lord and Christ. So if you're a Christian, you must know for certain that Jesus is Lord. As I mentioned uh, two weeks ago, you shouldn't say things like, well, I think, I think it's true. I think Jesus is Lord or I hope he is. I, I could be wrong, right? No, God's word is true and his word declares his lordship. You must be certain that Jesus is Lord. There's no middle ground when it comes to who Christ is, the Lordship of Christ. Amen. And Peter's final words are probably the heaviest, the hardest hitting. He says, he ends his sermon with, this Jesus whom you crucified. That's how he ends the sermon. How's that for a secret sensitive message? What in the world is Peter doing here? How does he expect to win anyone over for Christ by speaking like this? He should have been more pragmatic. He should have provided uh, a feast for them to come and then some entertainment, maybe a puppet show, and then get to know them for a few weeks and then maybe kind of address what they did to Jesus by saying, well, you know, you, sh you should have handled that a little better, uh, what you did to him, um, and then just tell them, Jesus loves you, Here's a bottle of water. Go back to your towns. No, he didn't do any of those silly things. The summation of this sermon was essentially this. Jesus Christ is Lord and you killed him. What Peter did here in the sermon goes against all human, pragmatic, rational thinking. It goes against 
all of the evangelical churches thinking, or much of the evangelical churches thinking today in America. We can learn a lot from this. Wasn't his goal to win people to Christ? How could he hit them over the head like this and expect anything good to happen? Well, maybe his goal wasn't to necessarily win them over to Christ. It was to glorify Christ. Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit and knew that the Word of God was powerful. He didn't need to water it down. In fact, if he did, he would be untruthful. He would be unloving. Peter used and trusted in the law of God and the power of the Holy Spirit to convict sinners of their sin. Which is something that's like foreign to so many American Christians today. You can't expect anyone to come to Christ without first knowing that they've sinned against a holy God. And the way that we show the sinner their sin is through God's law. He told these people they committed murder. And not just any murder, they murdered the very Son of God. It would be a very unkind thing to not tell these people the severity of their sin. So when it comes to evangelism, we have to explain to people in love, and please don't think like Peter's on a rampage here just pointing his finger at everybody. He's, what he's doing is in love, and we must do it in love. We must explain to people the reality of their sin in love and grace, right? But you must use words that the Bible uses. We can't sugarcoat it. And you can, there's no, it's not one or the other. You can lovingly tell people, implore people to repent of their sin without being harsh, without being nasty, because we were all in the same boat, right? We were all sinners saved by grace. But we have to use terms and words that the Bible uses to talk about our sin. I remember some years ago when I first started going to uh, the abortion mill in Jamaica, Queens, doing ministry there. I was there at Choices in Jamaica, which is a hellhole of a place, the worst place I've ever been to. And I was there alone in the morning, and I had a sign that said, Babies are murdered here, which I got from, uh, if you've ever seen the documentary, Babies are Murdered Here. Highly recommend you, you watch it. Simple sign. Babies are murdered here. Isn't that true? Isn't that what happens? And along came this young lady who said she was a believer, evangelical Christian. She did sidewalk counseling, which is great, uh, at, the, at, the, at that place sometimes. And she was not thrilled about my sign. She thought my sign would just make people angry, and that's it. And yes, people do get angry when they see that. She said, I should have a sign that says something like, there is hope, right? Or something to that effect. And I'm not opposed to having a sign like that, but I can't hold 12 signs. And I, the, the main thing that people need to hear or see as they go to this place of death to kill their child, they need to see the, what the law of God is. And the law of God says that that is murder. It's not terminating a pregnancy. It's taking the life of an image bearer of God, which according to God's law is murder. We have to call it what it is. Is there forgiveness for murder? Of course there is. But you can't be forgiven if you don't acknowledge what the sin is. Sinners have to hear the law of God to understand their sin against him. And then they must hear the hope of the gospel. Our job is to preach law and gospel to the sinner and let the Holy Spirit do the convicting. People may hate you for it. They may even try to kill you for it, but by God's grace, some people will be saved because of it. That is how God saves sinners. P Peter trusted in God's ability to convict and to convert the sinner. He was just a mouthpiece, and so are you and I. But on a practical level, how in the world could anyone hear such a heavy charge against them and not just react in anger as people often do when they're confronted with their sin. How could this not backfire on Peter? How could this not backfire on us when we share the gospel? And the answer is that it's all a work of the Holy Spirit. When someone is saved, that is a miracle. You might not think about it that way. When someone's convicted of their sin and they turn to Christ for forgiveness and salvation, they have eternal life, that's a supernatural work of God. That's more miraculous to me than 
any healing, to take a, a hardened sinner, the Bible says they're dead in their sin and trespasses, and make them a follower of Christ. Only God can do that. That is a miracle. Amen. Only God could take a heart of stone and make it a heart of flesh. If someone literally had a stone heart, or fake, let's say they had a fake heart, mechanical heart, and it was magically, miraculously transformed into an actual heart, you would say, that's a miracle. But if someone passes from death to life spiritually, like, oh, that's nice. No, that's a miracle. It's amazing. And for that reason, we can trust God to do what He will with His Word. He, he promises it won't return void. So we don't need gimmicks. We don't need to draw people in with fleshly, pragmatic, man-centered entertainment. People need to hear the preaching of Christ and Him crucified. They need to hear that they've sinned against a holy God and that the wrath of God abides on them if they don't repent and believe in the gospel. They need to hear that Jesus is the resurrected Lord of glory. Now what happened after Peter preached this heavy message? He ended on a, a heavy note. I, I don't think I would ever end a sermon like that. Um, I wouldn't end a sermon like, you're sinners, goodbye. <laughs> uh, you did this, bye. He ends on this note to just slam them over the head, so to speak, with the truth of what they've done. And what happens, verse 37. Now when they heard this, thousands of people... What happens? They were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? So the, the response of the crowd to that is every evangelist's dream. Anytime you preach the law and gospel, the goal is for the sinner to be convicted of their sin and turn to Christ. And the only reason why they were cut to the heart, it says, convicted of their sin, was because the Holy Spirit convicted them. No man has the power to convict the sinner, only the Holy Spirit. Jesus said in John 16 that when the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. Only he can do that, and that's what he did after Peter preached. By God's grace through the Holy Spirit, these people believed what Peter said that they were responsible for murdering the Son of God. Right? They didn't get defensive. They didn't make excuses. They believed Him and they were convicted and they were at the point where they said, what shall we do? Okay, we, we did this heinous thing. We are responsible. We have sinned really in the worst way imaginable. What could be worse than that? Now what? Is there any hope for us? And this is how it is for all people before they're saved. Or if you're outside of Christ, if you're not saved, you have to examine your heart before a holy God and say, what shall I do? Look at, what have I done? You have to come to the end of yourself, right? You, you have to truly believe and realize what the Word of God says about your sinful state, that you are not a good person. You are vile, you are a wretched sinner and a rebel against God. Now, if this was the end of the story, it'd be kind of depressing, wouldn't it? You guys killed Christ, see you later, and they all just weep and walk away. No. It wouldn't be gracious of Peter to just let them soak in their conviction without offering them a way out. But he does offer them a way out of the consequences of even this heinous crime of, of crucifying the Lord and he does that. He's gracious to them because that's what God has done for us, right? He, he's offered us a way out. And Peter explains what that is. So <clears throat> what he says in verse 38 to 40 there is how a person becomes a Christian. Verse 38 to 40. And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized. They said, what are we going to do? He says, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, 
save yourselves from this crooked generation. So the proper response to conviction of sin is repentance. There's many things you can do in response to conviction of sin, but they're not going to result in anything good. They will not result in salvation. You can get angry at the conviction of sin. You can get defensive. You can brush it off. You can ignore it and then go distract yourself from it uh, and it eventually will maybe go away, but that's a very foolish and dangerous thing to do. When God convicts you of sin, and this is true for believers as well, that is an act of God's mercy. That God would cause you to feel guilty for your sin is pure mercy. It's not mean, it's merciful. He has every right to just leave you in your sin and let you stand before him at the judgment seat with it. The only response God wants to see from conviction of sin is repentance. That is to turn away from this, your sin, to have a change of mind that results in a change of action. You do a 180. You're, you're going one way, living how you want to live, doing what you wanted to do, want to do, heading straight to hell, and God convicts you of your sin. And by faith in Christ, you turn away and you follow Christ. That's the only thing that will save you. What a foolish thing to take God's grace of conviction and repentance and just ignore it, just put it out of your mind, go home and watch Netflix till you forget about it. It's a foolish thing. Peter also said to be baptized. Why would he say that? You hear other commands, repent and believe the gospel. Peter says here, repent and be baptized. So baptism is an outward expression of, of an inward grace. Something has happened to you. You've been born again, and so you uh, profess that through water baptism. It's a public profession of faith in Christ. And that was no small thing for these Jewish believers, right? To publicly profess faith in Jesus through baptism in those days could now cost them their lives. Peter laid it all out for them here. The command was repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sin and, and to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit who had just arrived. What an amazing thing. He didn't tell them, go home and think about it. No, today, the Bible says, today is the day of salvation. Getting right with God is not something to put off because you're not guaranteed five minutes of life. He said this promise is, of forgiveness of sins is for them and their children, the whole world, those who are far off, right? Everyone who calls, who God calls to himself. Again, this is why Peter could preach so boldly. It was God who calls people to himself, right? He's just the messenger. You have to believe that when it comes to evangelism, sharing the gospel, whether it's with family, friends, strangers, that salvation is a work of God. This is how Christianity began, as a work of God, continues to grow today because it is a work of God. You don't convince people, you do not convince people to follow Christ like you would convince them to switch political parties, like our side is better, come over here. No, it's repent and believe the gospel. Be baptized, each one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins. And Peter continued exhorting them to come to Christ, to save themselves from this crooked generation. There's a, a sense of urgency. You have to do this now. If salvation is a work of God and people by nature hate God, they love their sin, how can they, how can they repent? How can they save themselves, as he says? For everyone whom God calls to himself, as Peter writes, for salvation, God's also going to enable them to come. Just like Jesus told the, wither, the, the man with the withered hand. Remember that story? And Jesus says to him, open your hand. How could he open his hand? His hand's withered. Right? But when Christ commanded him to do it, he also enabled him. And the hand opened. Charles Spurgeon said this, talking about Christ. His commandings are attended with enablings. And when his, where his commands are faithfully preached, 
His power goes with them and men are saved. So his commandings are attended with enablings. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God can and does enable sinners to believe and obey his commands, namely the gospel, to believe, right? And and everything else that follows after. If so, then you don't have to sugarcoat the gospel in order to appease people's flesh. You don't ever need to use gimmicks or tricks to try to convince people that their lives will be better if they follow Jesus, because oftentimes it's not. It's harder, but it's worth it. So, after all this, what was the result? What was the result of the first Christian sermon? Verse 41. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. You don't know how big the crowd was. All who received, apparently 3,000 people, 3,000 people were saved and added to the church after one sermon. I don't know if we've ever seen a revival to that degree in all of church history. So they went from 120 to 3,000. 3,000 plus probably with 120. Let me ask you this. Could that have happened any other way? Could, it have, could he have done something else to try to convince these people to come to Christ and to repent? No, right? Of course not. No one can be saved without the preaching of Christ. And no one can be saved without the Holy Spirit convicting them of their sin and showing them their need for Christ. Only God can save 3,000 people. You'd have a hard time convincing that many people in one shot to do anything at all, let alone put their faith in the man that they just killed. I couldn't convince 3,000 people to, to try my favorite pizza, let alone you convict them of their sin that you just killed Christ. Salvation is a work of God. And the means that God has ordained to save souls and to build his kingdom on earth is through messengers preaching Christ. And so what we see here with the conversion of 3,000 Jews at the end of this first Christian sermon is really just a much more exuberant picture of the same thing God is doing today. By God's grace... Rebellious sinners responsible for the death of Jesus, as we all are, are still being saved today through the preaching of the gospel as the Holy Spirit convicts their hearts of sin and causes them to repent and believe in Christ. You might not see 3,000 people saved at once. I would love to. It's not impossible. By God can send his Holy Spirit and the same thing can happen again. But every time one sinner is saved, that is a miraculous thing amazing work of the Holy Spirit. And what we need most of all today is for Christians to rely on the word of God alone and to boldly proclaim the gospel, salvation through Christ alone. And we need the Holy Spirit to convict sinners of their sin and to grant them repentance and faith in Christ. That's what we need in our homes. That's what we need in the lives of our friends and families. That's what we need in our communities. That's what we need in our our nation. This nation is rotting to the core, and no politician is going to fix it. I'm really concerned for our nation. And the only hope really is in the Holy Spirit and in the the hope of the message of the gospel. We need the Holy Spirit to bring people to say, what must I do? What do I do? What must I do to be saved? And that's only something that he can do as we are faithful to spread the good news. We rely only on God's word, the good news of the gospel. We spread that to those around us and we pray for God to send a great outpouring of his spirit like he did on the day of Pentecost. And that might be a while, but even in the meantime, we pray for the Holy Spirit to uh, convict individuals whom we 
we share the gospel with, whether they're friends, family, coworker, or anybody else, on an individual level, the Holy Spirit still is working in that way. And we pray for that. And so with that, let's pray as well. And we'll close with the hymn. <clears throat> Lord, I thank you for this amazing thing that you did. I thank you for sending the Holy Spirit, the helper, whom will convict the world of sin. I thank you for the hope of the message of the gospel. May we preach it to ourselves every day. May we rest in the power of your word, in the power of your Holy Spirit, God. Help us, Lord, to be faithful messengers in your hands, the mouthpiece that you would have us to be. Lord, we desperately need your Holy Spirit. Lord, we are powerless to do anything. Help us to be faithful, but Lord, we also need your Holy Spirit to move in the lives of our friends and family in our nation, our community. Lord, may it be so. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.